Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind, episode 88. The goal of our program is focused on education and employment. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the luminous mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Eric Bumbladis. Eric has five years of experience in social services. He's currently on assignment at America Corps Vista. He's been working at Innovative Services Northwest for the Youth Impact Program since May of 2015. His role is to help develop the program, which is designed to insist at Promise Youth in becoming self-sufficient. Welcome, Eric. Hi, thank you. Yeah, it's exciting to have you here. This is going to be a fun topic. I don't think I've ever talked to somebody about this, so this is going to be fun. Can you just briefly tell us about yourself, like where you come from and your hobbies and passions? And of course, let's move into your profession. Absolutely. Well, I just moved to Vancouver from Austin, Texas, where I've spent the last almost five years in social services. I'm 25 years old, so I still have a lot to go, but I was in case management. Before this job, I was doing employment services for adults with Goodwill Central Texas, and primarily that job was focused on helping individuals who have barriers to employment. I worked with primarily with individuals who uh, were exiting the justice system, had a criminal history, were homeless, dealing with substance abuse, and helping them find employment. And prior to that, I was involved with Caritas of Austin. It's a program to help homeless and refugees and asylum seekers uh, become self-sufficient. So as you probably can tell, there's this theme of me doing social services, more grassroots types of work and helping people in general with their goals and with their life. And naturally, that led me to where I am now with AmeriCorps in a more development sort of role, kind of working more behind the scenes, whereas in the past I've worked primarily with people one-on-one. -one -one. And that's a little bit about my work in terms of uh, what I like to do in my free time. I think that's actually a really important thing in social services because it can be very intense and having a way to blow off some steam and some stress is important. So I like to exercise, uh, keep in shape. A lot of that's also just doing fun cardio activities, mountain biking, swimming, kickboxing, running. I love to cook. Anthony Bourdain and Elton Brown are probably two of my heroes. I love learning about cooking and trying different types of food. Portland is like a huge food mecca. There's lots of good food, lots of good beer. So I like to do all kind of explore those things in my free time. That's awesome. Yeah, Portland is a fun place to hike and bike. And like you said, I love, especially in the Northwest District, uh, yummy restaurants over there. At least that's what I remember from like 20 years ago. So <laughs> anyway, yeah. well, tell us like a little bit more about the inspiration behind your work and how you found this passion of helping other people. Yeah, it really kind of started in high school. So I was in the public school system until my freshman year of high school and I remember the final year of being a freshman and really just being dissatisfied with my experience so I decided to take it on myself and look at some alternative schools and private schools and that led me to find uh, the Cabelli School in Austin, Texas and the Cabelli School is kind of where this whole thing about helping people and kind of being more globally minded started a lot of this, so is that a private school or what? yes it's a it's a private school oh, and it was cool. it was started by Kotso and his wife Moya Cabelli and the whole premise of the school is to instill the students with a sense of freedom and using that freedom to allow them to fall in love with learning and that is something I really learned and I think I really developed or planted the seed for who I wanted to become and so in my sophomore year at Cabelli we did a social service trip, if you will, to Antigua, Guatemala, 
it's a small group of us. There was probably, I think, six. And it was a project that was similar to Habitat for Humanity, if you're familiar with their program. Yeah. This was with an initiative founded by um, a Dutch woman. It's called Construe Casa. And they're still very active and still a great organization. So we volunteered with Construe Casa in several rural villages helping build cinder block, basic cinder block homes for impoverished families. And that is, I think, the, if you will, the genesis of where I really kind of felt like I could make an impact on someone else's life whom I may not really have a relationship to, and it being a very enriching experience. Well, and how did, like, being in that, wouldn't necessarily say it's a third world country, but it's definitely not America, you know, it's not the riches that we have here. How did that, being in that environment, help you to decide, I mean, to want to help people like that? Right. That was certainly part of my experience is seeing the juxtaposition of, you know, uh, an impoverished society people in their view too they might not really see it that way they may see it just as the normal thing but certainly coming from a more industrialized society where we have tvs and phones and all these you know kind of luxuries we may or less take for granted seeing that that's not really accessible in that world and seeing how I may take these luxuries for granted was very stark to me and seeing how people live just very basically and very simply and that really kind of resonated with me great and yeah and that's kind of how I feel so then going through that program in your school that led you to want to do this and then what was your higher learning like is that how it worked <laughs> yeah it was a process I have a half sister she's I believe 38 she's listening to this she's like why don't you know my age <laughs> uh, well, the important thing is that Rita, she was one well, still is involved with working with cooperatives and community owned, community run grocery stores. Oh, and let's see. so a large role of, of her being involved in that was going on these delegation trips to other farmer cooperatives in other parts of the world. She went to Guatemala and visited the Sesmatch uh, coffee coffee cooperative and that and learning about her experiences at the time also really kind of helped raise my awareness of fair trade and rainforest preservation and land stewardship and all of that so she was also had a, a role in, in helping me kind of understand a little bit more about what's going on in the world and the different solutions people are coming up with. So I guess when I was in high school, I took it on myself to learn more about fair trade. And I also learned about the Zapatista movement in Mexico. So I thought that was really interesting to hear about uh, how people in these societies recognize that they're being oppressed and how they took it upon themselves to improve their livelihoods. And that, I think, was just really empowering. And what did you learn, like, I mean, as far as free trade and then the movement in Mexico? I mean, you said that they were oppressed. Do they want free trade? Or, I mean, maybe explain a little bit more about what that looks like and how that might help people from, I don't I don't want to call it third world, but, you know, in, yeah. in places like developing that. Developing countries. Yeah, developing countries. Well, if we're talking about specifics, you know, the Zapatista movement started as a resistance to North American Free Trade Agreement. And that agreement was a, there's a very important distinction to make between free trade and fair trade. And, you know, free trade is a general economic policy to allow the unrestricted flow of goods and products between two different nations. But that has an adverse effect on countries that may have a smaller economy of scale. So at the time, Mexican agriculture wasn't as largely uh, subsidized as the one in America. So what happened is that a lot of wages and prices went down in Mexico, and there was a group of indigenous farmers who basically had enough of the bureaucracy and decided to create a movement to raise more awareness to say, why can't we create a mutually beneficial system to uh, to benefit not just our livelihoods, but everybody else's? And that's just obviously a very simplistic view at the conflict. But 
in general, that's kind of how it started. Well, that's interesting. That's only for my, I mean, I just want to know for my own, you know, I've studied a little bit about free trade and how that would help uh, developing countries, but I didn't really understand the politics behind it. So I'm just trying to understand what you're saying, that basically, you know, they're subsidized by the government, like our farmers. Anyway, where they're getting extra money, it creates a, an unbalanced situation where, you know, these farmers, that they're not getting extra money, but they can't increase their wages, basically, to an American standard because of that extra government help. Is that, do I understand yeah. That, right? that is. Okay. That is. And then free trade, uh, sorry, fair trade is sort of a, a barrier and it allows kind of a more uh, even playing field for smaller farmers in that context. Okay. Awesome. That is great. So how was your paradigm kind of changed with all of this that you had learned? I mean, starting from a young youth to your uh, adult 25-year-old mind, how has things changed for you? Like that? Yeah. Well, and so obviously, if we're going chronologically too, I mean, there is my experience in high school I talked about, then there's the, ex- the four-year experience I had in college doing my undergrad. And learning about, like we were just discussing with uh, free trade and all the politics and all that, that was my focus in college. I have a bachelor's of arts degree in global studies, which is similar to international studies and political science with a minor in Latin American studies. So I, well, I think a big part of this, part of the reason I chose that degree too is living in Austin, it's Texas, I would say, is probably at the forefront of immigration debate and immigration reform. And so I think a lot of my paradigm and and learning about how to help people, how that evolved in college, I guess, is learning about the immigration issue. I think I was able to finally take my interests globally and put them locally and find out how I could help in this context undocumented citizens, as well as refugees and asylum seekers. So I did a lot uh, with that in college. I was a member of the Student Farm Worker Alliance that worked in partnership with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, which is a coalition of migrant farm workers living and working in Immokalee, Florida. I also did a lot with fair trade and also got involved and volunteered and interned with local nonprofits, Casa Marianella and Caritas of Austin. Um, I was doing ESL. I was also involved in uh, helping people with their basic needs. So it was really just a, you know, what it was for me, I think, Rebecca, was that, you know, in college, when you sit down and you learn about, when you're learning and you're in class, it's like they only presented me with problems. Here are all the problems in the world. And it really took it on me to try and come up with solutions or come up with ideas. And that's why I became so active, like I met, just mentioned. I think college was a big part of that shift in my paradigm and understanding how I could reach out to people. Yeah, sometimes we want to, it all sounds, you know, Pollyannish type on paper, but to really get involved and to see the needs and to see how you can help definitely causes you to think about things a little bit differently, I would say, so... Awesome. Exactly. So can you tell me kind of about your mentors that you had as you're going through this process and how they made a difference in your success? Mm-hmm. And then I'm also interested, I, I guess we'll get to that a little later, but I just think it's interesting that you, you know, you studied out the private high school and I just want to know how supportive your parents were with that. Yeah, they've been very supportive and I'm so thankful and so grateful for them. I know in my work now in social services, I know that some adults my age don't really have that support from their family, uh, never really had that support. So I am very I acknowledge that and I'm very grateful for the support I get from my mother and father. They've been very supportive of me each step of the way. And I think my dad, he's been very helpful in, in helping me decide what my career goal is and what sort of path I should take. And I think mm-hmm. when I approached them with that idea of going to a private high school, they they understood that I wanted to do it to better myself. And if their child could have a good, fulfilling life, then why not? So I think they really understand that, and I'm grateful to them for that. I think as far as mentors go, you know, I talked a little bit about my sister, Rita. She is a huge inspiration. I think she's had a lot of success in her life, and I I look up to her. And, you know, she's very passionate about what she does, and that really resonates with me. And that's something I try and emulate in my own life. 
I also would say a mentor would be Ira Israel. He was actually my, I think he was, if I remember correctly, my Western geography or Western history teacher in high school. That's where I first met him. And eventually he left Cabelli and I graduated from there, but we still remained in contact. And he actually introduced, and a lot of his background and sort of, well, a lot of his background is in Eastern mysticism and, and yoga. And so he had a big role in helping me establish myself emotionally and spiritually. I think young teenagers and adults kind of have this sort of, you know, identity crisis. And that's <laughs> sort of what our teenage years are for, right? It's, it's trying to understand who we are, both in the context of our friends, of our habits, of our routines. And I think Ira really helped me through that and kind of understanding who I am and what I want for my life. He and a couple other people introduced me to practicing yoga and doing the physical practice and, and also taking that off the mat, so to speak, and bringing yoga into your everyday life. He certainly had a big role in, in my spiritual development. Great. Well, and I love how you're talking about that. That is a paradigm shift just in all of its, you know, itself of when you're a youth, the, the struggle that you go through to really identify with who you are. And sometimes we're so busy trying to follow the crowd and definitely your work doesn't follow like the typical American teen, you know, <laughs> <laughs> desire I guess. Um, and I think it's neat, too, when you talk about your parents being supportive of your role in like working in nonprofits. I think sometimes parents just like, oh, whatever you can do to make the most money, <laughs> <laughs> you know, is what they want to do. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's great. That's awesome. So and you had down here on some of your notes that what's your dad's motto that he lives by? Oh, he's like, son, every bit in moderation. <laughs> And that's sort of his whole like life philosophy is when he's taking on something new or doing something different. I mean, even when he was in retirement, when he left his job, he actually worked for a couple more days after his retirement just to make sure everything went smoothly. Like he's not, you know, it's moderation. He's just not going to jump right into it. And, you know, and then there was a period of him trying to figure out, well, now I'm a free man. What do I do? And so I, I think he, as a kid, he loved sailing. And so he actually went to a, and did some, uh, learned about sailing in Florida. I think it was off the Bahamas that he went to a little school. And I thought that was really cool. Uh, I, I think take that motto with me, taking things in moderation. I think, you know, sometimes, and it also means to me, you've got to take some things with a grain of salt before you really kind of dive into it. Yeah, to just uh, enjoy the process and know that you're going to have problems and, you know, those types of things arise and, and just enjoy it, the whole process. So exactly. Awesome. Before we go on, let us take a minute and hear about our sponsors. Hey, Firestarters. This is Mark, producer of The Luminous Mind. If you're like me, the thought of going out to the store and shopping is enough to make you want to crawl in a hole and hide. If that's you, then do your shopping online through Amazon. Just go to theluminousmind.net, click on the Amazon link, and shop away. Also, most of the books and resources that Rebecca and her guests discuss can be found on our Amazon links as well. Again, if you're like me, you have already accidentally signed up for Amazon Prime. So most of those purchases should have free shipping as well. Good luck. Mind with Eric from Gladys. Well, let's turn our focus a little bit more back to what you do, what services you offer for this Youth Impact Program, and just definitely tell us more about that. I think it's just an interesting concept. Certainly, I'd love to. And I think it's, and by the way, I just want to thank you too to give me the opportunity to kind of shamelessly post a little bit about or advertise about our program because <laughs> we do want to get the word out. The Youth Impact Program 
is part of Innovative Services, and Innovative Services has been around for a long time providing rehabilitative care and therapy for uh, children with disabilities, but they have a lot of other excellent programs. So the Youth Impact Program is designed to help youth between the ages of 15 and 24 become more self-sufficient, and the way that we have designed that is through helping with their employment goals. And that's the you know, primary service that the program provides, but we are looking at, and with the new contract, we are looking at other alternative ways. I mentioned that I've had experience in this, doing employment services, and I understand that you know you just can't give a resume to someone say, hey, go get a job. You have to work on other barriers first, whether it be housing, whether it might be self-esteem issues. So you kind of need to work on that. And so what we at the Youth Impact Program are looking at is doing some fun sort of social programming activities. We went to the park uh, last week, had a nice little outing out there. We're looking at going to the bowling alley, just kind of fun kind of things we can do to help you know, help uh, our youth clients feel a little bit more engaged before we can really sit down and talk about the employment piece. Well, and like you were talking about, I'm imagining that the youth that are coming to you have like dysfunctional homes. They haven't been to good schools. They haven't been mentored correctly. Is that right? I mean, what are some challenges that that you see with some of these youth coming in? Like you said, you can't just hand them a resume. Uh, What are some ways that you kind of help groom them other than just spending time with them? or Right. Well, we are working, uh, we have established a connection with the public schooling system. We learned that there are a lot of dropouts. So I think with that in mind, one thing that we can't provide directly but are looking for partnerships is to do GED training. You know, we obviously want to try our hardest to help these kids stay in school so they don't have to worry about getting a GED. But you know, that, that is something that, that comes up a lot, and that's something that we would probably need to address. Like you said, the broken homes, I'm honestly, in my interactions with some of our foster youth, I'm really impressed with how self-sufficient they are. And some of them have are in a roommate situation, so it's not like they're necessarily homeless. Some of them are wards of the state, so they do have a foster family to love and care for them. So right now, I, I think from what I've seen, education is a big uh, component to these clients becoming employable. So that's so far been my experience. And like I said, I, I started it in May, so I'm still sort of getting a read on on these issues. Yeah, that's great. So what successes have you seen with this program? Yeah, well, I recently heard that we had a client who completed her CNA training. So that's always something that's really important is focusing on that educational aspect of our program. It's, like I said, either for GED or some sort of uh, trades. And I've also been impressed Uh, with how open our clients have been with providing feedback. I did a survey recently to kind of gauge what sort of activities and social activities they would like to do, and we received a lot of good feedback. That's kind of where the idea of the park and the bowling alley came from. So a lot of what we're doing is, you know, trying to ask our clients what they would like to see, uh, what they would like to get out of our program and we can use that to further help them and and see them succeed well and and do you want to tell us why like that interaction is so important i would i guess i'm just picturing in my mind that maybe some of these kids don't have a very good support system and so that's what those social (laughs) activities do is right is that it connects them with other youth that may have you know similar situation that maybe they can um network with is that It is, and it is part of that resource pool. So certainly, for all the reasons you've explained, that would be a very, that's what we envision. Oh, great. So and what could the community do to be more helpful in providing better services for these individuals? Or uh, I noticed that some people, you know, you have volunteers, and then you also have uh, donations and stuff. Do you want to kind of explain that? 
Certainly. We actually have our first youth volunteer who will be helping us out, so that's exciting. I think as far as what the community can provide, I, I know that it would be really helpful to get some more youth referrals. So, you know, the more youth we get, the more youth we can serve. And we do, our program is unique because we have our caseworkers have a smaller caseload, but it allows for more individualized attention. And we do have these social activities to, to help provide that sort of social network that they might lack. So in terms of donations, you know, we can always, we recently received some clothing and toiletries, which is always very useful, especially uh, if they're well-maintained clothes. Clothes are good for interviews, for those first impressions. And I think, too, we're also looking at efforts to collaborate with other communities. You know, we don't want to necessarily reinvent the wheel for youth services. There is a need for it. So I see a community where we're all sort of supporting one another in this effort to help empower youth, then the more partnerships that we can receive, that to me means that we can also reach out to more youth. So those are certain things that we're trying to to get from our community. That's great. Well, and you think about back in, in your youth, not everyone has the chance to go to you know, a developing country. And sometimes we don't feel like, oh, well, there's nothing to do here. You know, there's nobody that really needs our help. But I mean, what kind of youth are you looking for? You said you're looking for more referrals and stuff like that. Describe the kind of youth that you want to help that you think that your program helps the most. Well, so the program is designed and we're still certainly focusing on helping youth who are both in foster care and have also aged out of foster care. I know with the new, at least I think there's a new law now that says that once they've reached 18, they can either leave foster care or they can go back into the system. So our program, because of our age uh, eligibility, we are still able to help those youth because they may need some more direction or they you know, may need a little bit more advice before they can go out into the world on their own. So I think that's an important population to assist. I've also seen in, in my other experiences homeless youth, youth from broken homes. It's also really important. Also, I think a matter of public safety, because sometimes when there is no social net for them, safety net for them, for at least homeless youth, some of them do turn to crime. And I'm not saying as a blanket statement, but it may happen. So I think if we can create a system or if our program can reach out to those individuals, then that would also, I think, benefit the community as a whole. Yeah. Um, and exactly. and on that note too, I mean, there are there will be youth who do have a criminal history, uh, so we also want to assist them because just as having a, a as your age may very well be a barrier, because it's you know if you're 16, an employer may perceive that you don't really have a lot of experience. It would be a double whammy if they also have a record. So that, that's also another kind of group that we would like. So foster youth, homeless youth, and youth who have criminal history. Well, and it does sound like, um, I uh, completely agree, like the 18 to your your mid to late 20s, that is kind of a, a place if you're not on the right trajectory. You know, you do get into trouble. Do you see anything like with uh, single mothers or you know, in that kind of situation where they're not educated or anything, but then they have little kids that they're still trying to take care of. And I mean, do you see anything like that? Yes. And I mean, the program we can only assist youth because of the, the stipulations of our grant. However, you know, we have talked with other organizations that while they may not necessarily be doing services for youth, they do have adults who like you said, or might be single mothers that have children. So we are trying to look into and find programs that we could potentially get some clients that are from families or might know someone in need of our services. That's great. So besides uh, like foster homes and stuff, do you help some of these children get placed for adoptions or... Do you just mostly focus on, you know, keeping them in a, a good foster home? Well, actually, like I said, the goal of our program is focused on education and employment. 
as far as their foster care goes or adoption, that would have to be taken up with whichever agency is representing them. We can't uh, necessarily be involved in that. Okay. All right. That's awesome. So mostly uh, helping with employment and a good social network and then helping them find jobs and stuff. So Precisely. That's, that's awesome. Okay. So does the nonprofit have any long-term goals of directions that you want to see this move in? Yeah, we do. I think one thing that we, we want to do is, wish I had the numbers with me, but we, that we do have a, a number of individuals we want to see placed. We have our, our target goals for the number of clients that we want to see that get jobs, that get put in occupational training, as well as have a successful exit. So that's obviously a goal for us to make sure that we are doing our jobs. And I think also just seeing us as, like I was mentioning earlier, about being involved in a mutually supportive community that helps uh, young adults and youth in transition, whether it be being in foster care and looking for employment or being homeless and looking for housing. So the, these are the kind of visions that we want to see. And I think another idea we've been tossing around is it would be really great to have a place, like a building, where we could provide our services. Because right now we're actually operating out of the third floor of, of innovative services. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're trying to, and this whole thing about getting out there and getting our voice into the communities, because we want to be a little bit more visible. So I think whether we do that through networking, cold calls, I think if we had a, a physical place that was a little more noticeable, I think that would also be a long-term goal. That would be great, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ask this question. I know you're kind of young and everything, but I just feel like you're kind of moving in this direction anyway. But if you can leave a legacy, what do you hope it's going to be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that question and uh, I, I had to think about it. You know, I think if I wanted to have a legacy, the whole thing that I'm working on right now, right, my whole goal right now is to help people and assist people with their basic needs. And I certainly don't think that we should have a utopia where everybody gets what they want and that you know, it's a completely fair and equitable society. I, I think that's an ideal, but I don't think it will ever happen. So I think as long as I'm around and I will continue trying to help people and my legacy in, in this sense then be that, that I would be helping develop a system where in the future it still exists. There's still these programs still in place where people can get the, the help that they need. So I don't know, Rebecca, if I start a nonprofit uh, or are involved in, in running one that exists for however long, that would also be something that I could see as an important part in achieving that legacy of helping other people. That would be awesome. Like I said, I really think that you're on your way to having a legacy. I, I was thinking today as I was driving down the road that legacy really is a one-day journey at a time, and then one day you wake up and you realize what people think of you and how you've gone about working towards that legacy sometimes we don't realize it but it's an everyday daily thing and then you know the interactions that we have with people so i really commend you i think you're doing amazing things i think it's fun to see you try to help here in america because like i said sometimes we want to go off to a developing nation and help them but there's definitely ways that people can reach out and help in their own communities to help other people lift exactly. them up, lift them and help them achieve higher as well. So Yes, exactly. Awesome. That's that's how I see it. <laughs> that is great. So before we say goodbye, do you have any final parting words of advice? And then give us your contact information of how we can get in touch with you. I would love to. I think some advice I would give is there's no such thing as bad questions. Always ask questions and learn as much as you can say that you don't know anything because you'll learn everything so say that you don't know nothing and then you'll learn you'll learn everything so come to the world with an open mind just, that's what i think is important that's and great you, advice yeah and if you want to be in contact with me i have a twitter account right now i'm at the Cove. Vista, and I also have a LinkedIn. I believe it's a public profile. You can look for me through Eric Bumblatus. 
That is great. Well, thank you. And I'll be sure to put your contact information on the show notes so that our uh, listeners can get in touch with you. That'd be awesome. So, well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been super fun to talk to you and to hear about what you're doing to help your community and those around us. Well, and thank you for giving me the time and the place to talk a little bit more about my goals and my efforts. And I really appreciate this conversation. So thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Eric Bumbladis, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and consider joining our program by going to the scheduling tab to become a fire starter today. Help support the podcast by making all your Amazon purchases through the free Amazon widget on our website. Also, sign up to receive two free audiobooks from Audible at theluminousmind.net. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Google+, get our audio content on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider telling your friends about us. Leave us a review. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 